Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Remember E equals MC squared? This was Einstein's precursor to his general theory of relativity that describes how mass affects space and time, which are fundamentally interconnected. Stephen Hawking said it is a theory not only of curved space, but of curved or warped time as well. The big question that physicists have been pondering for decades is, can space and time warp so dramatically that certain points in time touch or overlap? making time travel possible. The story of Santiago Flight 513 is an intriguing tale that highlights our fascination with the idea of time warps. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, weirdos! This is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode of Weird Darkness… Help! Help! Oh my God! Frank is murdering the whole family! Rouse the neighbors! These cries from a terrified woman led to the story of several attempted murders and a song that most have forgotten. After a series of attacks on farm animals in Puerto Rico, numerous people reported sightings of the creature at fault. But the strange thing is that none of the reports seemed to match, as if each sighting was of a different unknown animal. Behind the friendly demeanor of Robert Berdella lurked a deadly obsession with torture and murder. He soon earned the label The Butcher of Kansas City. Weirdo family member Chris Mazulik tells the true story of him and his friends getting exactly what they asked for and wishing they hadn't. But first, critics of the Santiago Flight 513 story insist it's nothing more than an urban myth or an attempt to sell newspapers. But is there evidence to contradict their conclusions? We'll begin there. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. Much has been written about air travel since it was first commercially available for holidaymakers. One enterprising newspaper reporter by the name of Irwin Fisher published 1950s Airliner Lands with 92 Skeletons on Board in the Weekly World News tabloid magazine on November 14, 1989. Santiago Flight 513 departed from Aiken in what was then West Germany on September 4, 1954. On board the Lockheed Super Constellation were 88 passengers and four crew members. The flight was just another typical and routine trip between two cities. The passengers would have had no reason to think twice about it. Somewhere over the Atlantic, though, something happened. The flight disappeared without a trace and never arrived at its destination. That was until October 12, 1989, when it made an approach to Port Alegre circled the airport, and made a successful landing. During 513's descent, the crew neither made nor acknowledged contact with local air traffic controllers. Unsure about the situation, airport authorities sent a team out to investigate. While the aircraft itself might have been less technologically advanced, it might not have looked totally out of place. However, the airline, Santiago, had ceased operating in 1956 more pressing questions took precedence over this one, though. 
When security forces gained access to the plane, the reason for the lack of communication was immediately clear. Answering that mystery only opened a deeper and much more pertinent one. First responders came across the gruesome sight of 92 skeletons, all sitting in their seats. The skeleton of Miguel Victor Curry, the captain, still had hold of the controls and the engines were still idling, something that can only be accomplished with the aircraft safely on the ground. No sooner had the gruesome discovery been made, explanations and theories were proposed and debated. Among these was the rather obvious theory of a hoax or urban legend. At least one researcher into the realm of paranormal events went on record to declare that the only possible explanation that fits all of the reported details is that the aircraft utilized a time warp. However, Dr. Kelso Atello was unable to explain the reduction of all on board to a skeletal state, nor could he adequately fathom how the skeleton captain could have possibly landed the plane. Officials from the Brazilian government did investigate the circumstances of the flight, but outright refused to be drawn to any conclusions or any aspects of the investigation as a whole. Aviation officials only confirmed that the aircraft appeared out of thin air and landed safely. The debate over what happened took on a whole new outlook when the perceived secrecy behind the investigation angered many, including Dr. Atello. Researchers made numerous calls to the government and asked them to allow civilians to assist in the ongoing investigation. Other academics and dignitaries were quick to jump on the bandwagon and insisted that the public had a right to know what was going on. They felt that the government had a duty of care to actually come clean and reveal what they knew. Retired physics professor Rodrigo de Mana believed that it was a crime against science to withhold any known information, no matter what it was. He stated if this plane did enter a time warp and there is evidence to prove it, the entire world should be told. Something like this could change the way we view our world and alter science as we know it, he said. A counter-argument to this was that the government could reveal what many people considered to be the truth and risk an all-out panic or they could keep quiet and risk involving themselves in a cover-up. Critics of the Flight 513 story insist it's nothing more than an urban myth or an attempt to sell newspapers. However, there is a cherished place for our science fiction stories. Numerous popular books and movies about time warps such as Back to the Future or The Philadelphia Experiment, not to mention great science fiction TV shows such as Star Trek, sparked the imaginations of many future scientists. In countless cases, science fiction has become science fact. Atomic clocks have demonstrated the space-time relationship by showing how time does speed up the further away one moves from the center of the Earth or large masses like mountains. The reduction of gravitational force causes an atomic clock to run quicker. On the contrary, time slows down when traveling at a high speed. Scientists have also confirmed Einstein's theory by observing how the Sun warps space by seeing light or radio waves bend around it. Some of the most spectacular scientific discoveries in history begin with the seeds of wild fantasies and science fiction. Is it really feasible that a transatlantic flight could take off in one generation and disappear for 35 years before it reappears and lands safely with its dead crew aboard? Probably not. Perhaps time travel may never be a reality either. But within the stories like Flight 513, the imagination is an unbounded playground where one can take that trip through the proverbial wormhole. So enjoy the journey. Residents of West 30th Street, New York City, were startled on the night of October 26, 1858 by the cries of Elizabeth Carr, a servant of the Goldie family, as she ran from the house in her nightclothes, screaming, Help! Help! 
Oh my God, Frank is murdering the whole family! Rouse the neighbors! The neighbors, accompanied by several policemen, responded by entering the Goldie home where they found husband, Francis Goldie, who lay on the floor not moving. Also suffering from head wounds were 11 year old Nathaniel Goldie, 7 year old Charlie Goldie, and Joanna Murphy, another of the Goldie's servant girls. All were alive but semi conscious. The perpetrator of the crime, Frank Goldie, was found in his room, dead from a self inflicted gunshot to the head. Francis Goldie, 50 years old, was a wealthy retired lumber merchant who lived with his wife Jane and five children in a three-story house at 217 West 30th Street. Jane Goldie was his second wife and the mother of the two youngest children. The eldest children, Francis, known as Frank, Mary Eliza, and Nathaniel, were from his first wife. Frank Goldie had a reputation as a restless and wild young man. He'd been a sailor but grew tired of the sea, was a clerk at a dry goods store, and tired of that as well. At the time of the murder, he was living in idleness in his father's house and was the cause of grief to the family due to his habitual dissipation. Frank had always been a problem child, sometimes pleasant to his brothers and sisters, but often morose and vengeful with an uncontrollable temper. Frank had expressed an interest in going into business for himself, and his father had set up a bank account for him and deposited $50, with the understanding that the money was not to be touched until Frank started his business. But Frank considered the money to be his unconditionally. He took the bank book from his father's desk, withdrew $10, and went on a frolic. The attacks took place after Francis confronted his son over the theft. The events of the night of October 26th were pieced together from the testimony of Mary Goldie, who had been in the house but was unharmed, and the most cogent of the victims, Jane Gouldy and Elizabeth Carr. Frank came home at about 10 o'clock, and his father reprimanded him about the money, and Frank responded with a low, chuckling laugh, full of moaning and fiendish wickedness. Mrs. Gould heard Frank and her husband scuffling in the front room, then he entered her room and as she lay in bed, he hit her several times in the head with a dull hatchet. She rose up trying to ward off the blows, then fell to the floor. Frank passed through the hall to the bedroom of his two brothers, but they were not there. They had heard the noise and ran to their father. When he found them, Frank struck them both with a hatchet. Elizabeth Carr and Joanna Murphy heard cries of murder, murder, and came running downstairs when they found Frank with a hatchet in his hand. He struck Joanna on the head and she fell to the floor, but Elizabeth was able to wrestle the hatchet away from him. She ran back to her room and he chased after her saying, "'Give me the hatchet, Lizzie! I do not wish to kill you, I only wish to escape!' But after wrenching it away from her, he gave Lizzie three blows to the head before running away. About a minute later, she heard a gunshot and thinking he was firing at her, she ran outside and called for help. Mary Goldie was also calling for help from her bedroom window. She had come out of her room to see what was going on, and she saw Frank striking Joanna Murphy. Mary ran back to her room and locked the door. All of the victims were taken to the hospital in critical condition, and for a while it did not appear that any of them would survive. But gradually they recovered from their wounds, and Mrs. Goldie, who was pregnant at the time of the attack, gave birth to a healthy baby. Only Elizabeth Carr, who had been most active in fighting off her attacker, succumbed. She had suffered a fractured skull and compression of the brain and appeared to be recovering comfortably, but on November 12th, her condition suddenly changed and she died two days later. The savage attacks by Frank Goldie were the subject of an all-but-forgotten song entitled The 30th Street Murder by the wandering New York songwriter Henry S. Backus. When Weird Darkness Returns After a series of attacks on farm animals in Puerto Rico, numerous people reported sightings of the creature at fault. But the strange thing is that none of the reports seemed to match, as if each sighting was of a different unknown animal. Behind the friendly demeanor of Robert Burdella lurked a deadly obsession with torture and murder. He soon earned the label the Butcher of Kansas City. 
and weirdo family member Chris Mazulik tells the story of him and his friends getting exactly what they asked for and wishing they hadn't. These stories are up next. You're listening to a Weird Darkness Darkives episode, where I reach back to share an episode with you from years past. If my voice sounds different in this episode, it's because the recordings are older, my presentation style was different, and my voice has naturally gotten lower over the years. For some of you, this will be a nice blast from the past. For others, it'll be new to you with stories you've not yet heard me tell. My goal now is to bring you new episodes of Weird Darkness every Monday through Friday as best I can, and also post a Dark Archives episode, or Darkives episode, every day of the week as well. I hope you enjoy the new schedule. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. In August 1995, the Canavanas region of the island of Puerto Rico was hit by a spate of very bizarre attacks on farm animals. The unfortunate creatures, typically goats, chickens, and pigs, were found dead with deep puncture wounds to their necks and amid controversial claims that significant amounts of blood were missing from their corpses. Farmers were on edge, the media had an absolute field day, and the people of Puerto Rico were plunged into states that ranged from fear to hysteria. When similar killings began to be reported in numerous other parts of Puerto Rico, that fear was amplified to even greater levels. All of which is hardly surprising when one takes into consideration the physical appearance of the beast that was believed to be behind all of the slaughtering. It became known as the Chupacabra. The first person, so far as we know, to see the beast of this particular wave was a woman named Madeline Tolentino, who lived in Canavanas, the initial scene of all the action. She described it as a fairly compact animal that ran on two legs, in a strange hopping style, and which had what looked like rows of feathers running down the back of its head and spine. As media interest grew and grew, so did sightings of the mysterious monster but that's when things became not just interesting, but beyond interesting. There's a very good reason for that. Not everyone saw the same beast that Tolentino encountered, or at least it did not look the same. It's one thing to suggest that in the 1990s, one unknown and dangerous animal was on the loose on Puerto Rico. It's quite another, however, to suggest that multiple strange creatures were running wild on the island. And yet, that happens to have been exactly what was going on. Unless all of the reports were of the same monster. But given their physical differences, how could that be? Very easily, that's how, if the chupacabra is a shapeshifter, which is a theory I have heard time and again from Puerto Rico. Although the first sighting of the creature in the summer of 1995 effectively dictated how the locals perceived the animal to look, not everyone reported something that resembled the monster seen by Madeline Tolentino, as we shall now see. In the days, weeks, months, and even years that followed, countless reports of chupacabra attacks on farm animals were reported. The problem, however, is that the descriptions of the beast varied to incredible degrees. In some cases, witnesses told of seeing an animal that did not have the feathery line running along the back of its head, neck, and spine as described by Tolentino. Instead, they saw a row of menacing-looking spikes, which stood erect and around four to five inches in length. And of course, it would be very hard to mistake a line of feathers for a row of vicious spikes. Then there was the matter of how the animal ran. 
According to both Tolentino and the majority of the early witnesses, it was a bipedal beast, albeit one which bounced along in a bizarre hopping fashion. Others, however, were sure that the creatures they saw ran on four limbs only, and there was nothing bizarre about its movements. They were likened to the way in which a large cat, such as a mountain lion, would stalk its prey. Now let us look at the eyes of the chupacabra. Some sightings involved creatures with bright blue eyes. In other cases, the eyes were of a piercing, devilish red and glowing variety. The most significant factor, however, was the matter of the wings of the chupacabra. Yes, that's correct. Wings. In some cases, but most certainly not all, the creatures were said to have had large and powerful-looking bat-like wings. In other words, they were black and leathery-looking. When faced with such stories, other witnesses swore the monsters had absolutely no wings at all. Adding to the puzzle is the fact that on my second expedition to seek out the Puerto Rican chupacabra, I spoke with a man named Pucho who saw such a thing, but which had wings like those of a large bird. They were feathery. Most controversial of all are the reports of the chupacabra transforming into a large and lumbering Bigfoot. I kid you not. I should stress that such reports are very rare and very few and far between, but I do have 11 such reports in my files. In all the cases, the witnesses saw the chupacabra engulfed by a near-blinding white light and then mutating into a large, hair-covered humanoid before their startled eyes. When we put all of this information together, we are clearly faced with a major-sized conundrum. How can one creature take on multiple appearances and forms? Well, the answer is that no normal animal can do such a thing. But there's nothing normal about the chupacabra. Rather, everything suggests it is undeniably abnormal or paranormal. For many of the people in Puerto Rico, the chupacabra can change its form a shape-altering monster. April 2nd, 1988, the day before Easter Sunday. A naked man with a dog collar around his neck leaps from the second-story window of a house in Kansas City's Hyde Park neighborhood. A neighbor finds the man crouched on his porch and calls 911. When police break open an unassuming white house on Charlotte Street, they find a tortured dungeon like something straight out of a horror movie. Inside the home, the police found more than 200 Polaroid photos and detailed torture logs documenting the kidnapping, torture, and eventual murder of at least six men, most of them male prostitutes between 1984 and 1988. They also seized torture devices, an extensive library on witchcraft and the occult, a satanic ritual robe, and a human skull in an upstairs closet. That weekend, residents in the quiet neighborhood were awakened to the sound of the police excavating the home's backyard, where they found bone fragments and an additional human head. The house belonged to Robert Burdella, the man who would soon become known as Kansas City's most notorious serial killer. Prior to his arrest, Burdella was that serial killer cliché, someone neighbors described as a nice man who kept to himself. He helped start a neighborhood watch program, had worked as a chef, and ran his own booth at the Westport Flea Market. Called Bob's Bizarre Bazaar, the booth was a Kansas City fixture that sold everything from human skulls and shrunken heads to occult books and antiques. On the weekend that Berdella was captured, the Final Four tournament was happening in Kansas City, and Berdella displayed four human skulls – some say actual skulls, but more likely only models – in the window of Bob's Bazaar Bazaar, along with a sign that read, The Final Four. In spite of the overwhelming and gruesome evidence found in Berdella's Hyde Park home, he was initially only charged with sodomy, felonious restraint, and first-degree assault. It took time for the authorities to realize the extent of Berdella's crimes, because the majority of his victims' bodies were never found. 
the list of atrocities that Berdella perpetrated on his victims would not be out of place in a movie like Saw or Hostel, including applying bleach to their eyes with cotton swabs, injecting their vocal cords with drain cleaner, and gouging one victim's eyes out just to see what would happen. Once his victims were dead, he dismembered the bodies in his bathtub and put the body parts out for the garbage men. If his seventh victim hadn't escaped, there's no telling how long he would have gone on killing. Once Perdella's case became public knowledge, popular rumor would have it that he cooked and served some of his victims as food at his shop, though there is no actual evidence to suggest that was the case. After his arrest, Berdella cited the 1965 film adaptation of John Fowle's novel The Collector, in which a man kidnaps a young woman and holds her captive in his basement as an inspiration for his murders. Berdella described his crimes as, my darkest fantasies becoming my reality. Berdella's own crimes inspired their share of movies, books, and even songs. A local radio personality wrote a parody song called They Call Me Bob Berdella to the tune of Donovan's 1966 hit Mellow Yellow. The parody played on local radio stations, which also gave out prizes to listeners who attended events wearing dog collars. In one of the only interviews he ever gave before his death, Berdella expressed his displeasure over the songs and the media coverage of his murders, claiming that the media dehumanized him just as he had dehumanized his victims. Berdella referred to himself as the neighbor next door who reached a point in his life where he could do monstrous acts. That's not the same thing as being a monster. Robert Berdella died of a heart attack in prison in 1992 after writing letters claiming that prison officials were not giving him his heart medication. Other accounts have since implied that Berdella was poisoned while behind bars, but no official investigation of his death was ever conducted. For whatever reason, Berdella never attained the national notoriety of killers like Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer, or John Wayne Gacy. These days he is largely forgotten outside of Kansas City, but those who grew up there such as your host of Weird Darkness, we still remember where we were when we first heard about the Butcher of Kansas City. If you go to the Westport Flea Market today, there is no plaque or sign to commemorate the spot where Bob's Bizarre Bizarre once stood, but most locals can still point it out. Tonight's final story comes from weirdo family member Chris Musilik. Here is his story. The night was like any other weekend in the middle of the National Allegheny Forest, camping with some friends and a couple of beers. There's a bunch of us and I'll introduce everyone on the way. I'm Chris. Same old, same old. We're at one of our favorite spots not too deep in the woods but deep enough to not hear anything but nature. So the night goes on, normal. We drank a good amount of beers and the girls decided to go to sleep. The boys were still up sitting around the fire. I had this idea, a horrible interesting thought that I said aloud. I wish… I wish we could see something we couldn't explain, something that if we tried to explain it to anyone nobody would believe us. At the moment, everyone was shaking their heads in agreement with me. They all said something of agreement. There was five of us at the moment sitting around the fire conjuring, something openly accepting anything into our reality, not just accepting, but we invited it. We asked for it. We wished for it. An hour or so went by, and we decided to call it a night. Nothing out of the ordinary other than our friend Trevor, he was a heavy drinker and had just as many drinks as we all did, but now he is completely sapped of all his energy. He passed out in his chair before we yelled something like, you sleeping in the chair, bud? He got up and stumbled to his tent. We laughed it off. It was pretty late anyway. He probably was just tired. After he was out, Nathaniel started getting really tired really quick and he called it a night. So that leaves me, Pete, and Larry. Awake. Bored. Not tired at all, but we didn't have anything to do. 
We went to our tents and noticed that they were soaked, like someone poured a gallon of water in them. Can't sleep in water, so we said that we'll call Pete's dad. He's a good guy and, well, he'd give us rides, so we didn't have to drive drunk. I left my phone in Trevor's car and he had the keys. We tried waking him, to no success. We decided to just take his keys and open his car. We were walking to his car and I swore I saw something sitting in the driver's seat, gripping the steering wheel. I just froze. Larry and Pete didn't. Until they saw it. Larry and Pete backpedaled faster than I've ever seen anyone and I'm like, did you see that guy? They had no words. I said, let's just walk home. Absolutely horrible idea. We're walking with the light of the moon to guide us. We looked down to notice I had a shadow, but Pete didn't. I said, Pete, why why don't you have a shadow? He looked horrified at me and replied, Chris, why do you have one? At this time, we noticed I was the only one of us that had a shadow. The coldest chill went over me and all my hair stood up. We stared at my shadow for only a second before it whipped away into the darkness of the woods. We started running for our lives, faster than we ever ran before until we reached a clearing with some weird object in the middle of this opening. It looked like a table with a bunch of stuff on it. I was drawn to it. I started walking through prickers off the trail to get to this table. Pete and Larry tried to stop me, but I insisted I wanted to see what it was. We passed this on the way here and that shrine wasn't there. I got within five feet of it, and as fast as you can blink, it was gone. We ran and ran and ran. The story doesn't end there. Nathaniel was awoke by someone stoking the fire and strumming on my guitar. He yelled out, cut it out, Chris. Nothing but silence. He looked out of his tent to see my guitar leaned up against a tree right next to his head. He went back to sleep. Not long after that, one of the girls named Ruth had to go to the bathroom. We're in the woods and it's scary at night, so she woke up Sadie to go with her. She did. They worked their way into the darkness not too far apart. When Ruth saw someone running in the woods in front of them, she thought Sadie was messing with her. Sadie saw and thought the same about Ruth. They both came back to the tent like, good try, almost got me. Both of them said it wasn't them chills. We made this happen. When you wish for something like this, you'll get results. It fed off of our friend's energy. It tormented us in our dreams, stalked us in the woods, and made us feel crazy. But then again, what exactly is normal? You don't have to believe it. Something unbelievable. It's exactly what we wished for. Thanks for listening. If you like the podcast, please share a link to this episode and recommend Weird Darkness to your friends, family, and co-workers who love the paranormal, horror stories, or true crime like you do. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. The Time Warp of Santiago Flight 513 was written by Lou Hewitt. The 30th Street Murder was written by Robert Wilhelm. Chupacabra Shapeshifter was written by Nick Redfern. Robert Burdella, Butcher of Kansas City, was by Oren Gray. And Be Careful What You Wish For is by Weirdo family member Chris Misulik. Weird Darkness Theme by Alibi Music. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Revelation 1.18. I am the living one. I was dead, and now, look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. And a final thought, we could never learn to be brave and patient if there were only joys in the world. Helen Keller. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. (laughs) 